The fourth skier on this slope triggered this persistent slab avalanche on a surface or a layer. Let's take what we've covered so far and come up with some supplemental and science-based ideas about where and when surface or layers can be triggered. But keep in mind the important and essential strategies for managing the risk due to persistent slabs are covered in avalanche courses. If you are looking to see if there is buried surface ore in the area, look in sheltered glades and open areas of the forest. Although these photos show open areas that are steep enough to slide, the best places to look for buried surface ore are openings that are not steep enough to slide. Since there is often less wind at lower elevations, buried surface ore is often larger and easier to trigger in open areas at lower elevations, like this log cut block. Avalanches can release on buried surface ore layers on surprisingly shallow slopes. I was not expecting this 32 degree slope to avalanche. I wonder if surface ore can release avalanches on such shallow slopes because of low friction from the surface ore crystals that have been flattened by the propagating crack. As Simon explained, the same weather that forms surface ore often forms near surface facets under the surface ore. In wind exposed areas like these, there may be buried facets that formed at the surface but no buried surface ore. Such observations in wind exposed areas suggest that there may be buried surface ore on top of the facets in sheltered areas. As we mentioned, surface ore crystals are often larger and surface ore layers are more often buried on cool shady slopes than on nearby sunny slopes. After a suspected surface ore layer has been buried, we can observe snow profiles or instability tests to search for buried surface ore on slopes that are not steep enough to slide. For small forest openings, the surface ore crystals tend to be larger in the middle where the snow surface has a wide view of the sky and hence optimal surface cooling. On sufficiently steep slopes with small openings in the forest, triggering may be more likely in the middle of the small openings. So, how can we deal with the insidious spatial variability of buried surface ore? When I asked Mark Pichet about advice to his younger self, here's part of his advice. I definitely spent a number of years where uh, I would try really, really hard to understand exactly what the avalanche problem was. And if it was surface ore, trying to understand where it was, where it wasn't, where it might be more reactive, where it would be less reactive. And even though that is still part of what I do on a daily basis, I tend to think of things in much bigger pictures now and, and on a more macro scale um, and spend a lot less energy trying to outsmart uh, the problem and just being more accepting of the problem and more willing to eliminate uh, larger swaths of terrain uh, from my run list or my terrain list for the day, uh, knowing that I'll get to go there again some other time in much better conditions. A buried layer of surface ore can retain crack propagation potential for a long time. Here is Dave Gauthier doing a propagation saw test on a two-month-old layer of surface ore. It was 1.7 meters deep. Riders are not likely to trigger a surface ore layer where it is deep like this. We are far more likely to initiate a crack in an old layer of surface ore where the slab is thin. Where the red bulb of high stress under the skier reaches the weak layer at a thin spot, the weak layer cracks. If the crack is long enough, it propagates and releases a slab avalanche. Speaking of crack propagation, look at the tracks in the bed surface. Clearly, a few tracks like these in a buried persistent weak layer like surface ore do not reliably prevent crack propagation and slab avalanches. Now let's look at when we get surprised by old surface ore layers. The research shows that surface ore layers slowly gain strength as load increases over time, but the strength gain lags behind the loading. Consequently, in the first few days after a snowfall, Persistent weak layers like surface ore are often more sensitive to triggering. Also, buried surface ore is slow to gain strength in response to dribs and drabs of snowfall. This has resulted in experienced people triggering unexpected avalanches during and soon after periods with incremental loading. Next, let's look at how the propensity of crack initiation and crack propagation change over time as the surface ore layer gets buried more deeply. When the overlying snow first becomes cohesive, it's easy to start a crack in the surface ore under a shallow slab. Then, as the layer is buried more deeply, it gets harder to initiate a crack in the surface ore layer. Initially, when the slab is shallow and soft, 
cracks in the surface ore layer are less likely to propagate. As the slab gets deeper and harder, propagation becomes more likely. Eventually, the surface ore layer becomes resistant to crack propagation. Sometimes this does not happen until melting, then refreezing, has penetrated to the surface ore layer. Most slab avalanches happen when conditions favor both crack initiation and crack propagation. When the slab is deep in most places, the slab is typically triggered from where it is thin. These avalanches are large, unexpected, and more often result in serious injury. The blue shows the active period when it is cautious to avoid or limit exposure to the terrain we just mentioned. To get some guidance on how long the active period lasts, let's put some numbers along the bottom of the graph. ASEC researchers made measurements at 120 slab avalanches that released on surface ore. Most were in the Columbia Mountains of Western Canada. These ranged in depth from 10 to 180 centimeters and averaged 60 centimeters. Instead of looking at how slab avalanche propensity changes with slab depth, we can look at the age of the surface ore layers. For the same 120 avalanches on surface ore layers, the age ranged from 1 to 35 days with an average of 14 days. However, in Mike Conlon's study of deep slab avalanches, the oldest surface ore layer was 68 days. Looking at Canadian data, professionals tend to become less concerned about surface ore problems once the depth of the layer has reached 60 to 90 centimeters and or the surface ore layer has been buried for three to five weeks. Let's get back to the third question from the case study. For recreationists planning a trip in an area with a Bolton, various decision aids are available. Based on considerable avalanche danger with a buried persistent weak layer like surface ore, the planning aid would have flagged steep open slopes including slopes in the south quadrant like these, as not recommended, extra caution, or high risk. Let's consider the same terrain from the perspective of avalanche practitioners at the morning meeting of an avalanche operation. The knowledge of the snowpack and persistent slab avalanches would be important. Locally, the surface hurl layer had released a slab avalanche about a week earlier. Thanks to information sharing between operations, the practitioners would know that, within the region, Riders had triggered three unexpected avalanches on the surface hoar layer in the previous three days. Also, the surface hoar layer had been buried for two and a half weeks, and the experienced team would likely still be wary of the layer. Further, they may have been cautious because the surface hoar layer was under a 60 to 70 centimeter deep slab, which is close to the average of the avalanches documented by researchers in the region. Based on the knowledge of regional avalanches on the surface hoar layer, and perhaps on the age and depth of the surface hoar layer, the experienced practitioners may have ruled out these steep open slopes. Some of the ways professionals track surface hoar layers are digging, slope management, information exchange, and snowpack evolution models. Digging pits and performing snowpack tests provide good information about the bonding and reactivity of a layer. However, point observations can miss surface ore, so this information is most useful for tracking a layer over time, rather than making real-time terrain decisions. People who use the same terrain regularly often pay close attention to where surface ore forms, as well as the history of traffic on specific slopes, so they can avoid suspect terrain. Sharing observations is helpful to get a larger scale view of where others have found surface ore. In Canada, professional reports are shared on the InfoX, and public reports are shared on Avalanche Canada's Mountain Information Network. Recently, some forecasting operations have been using snowpack evolution models to complement field observations. These models use past weather patterns to predict the snowpack. They can be helpful to identify general regions and time periods that had favorable conditions for surface ore formation. Putting it all together, the distribution of surface ore is dictated by the surface energy balance across terrain, often forming patterns tied to elevation, aspect, and forest cover. Surface ore is slow to bond and has a structure that's favorable for crack propagation. The insidious spatial variability and weak structure makes for challenging avalanche problems that generally require large safety margins.
We welcome your thoughts on this video in the comments section below, or you can contact us by email.